Hello and welcome to Afternoon Tea. I am Dr. Erica, a GP from the West Midlands in the UK, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Dr. Linda. She's an A&E emergency room um, doctor from Sheffield, and we're both lifestyle medicine physicians. Do let us know in the chat below where you're tuning in from and what brought you here today. <laughs> Hello and welcome, everyone. If you are new to us, uh, we are hosting Afternoon Tea every Sunday at 5 p.m. UK time, where you can connect with world-renowned lifestyle medicine experts. And we share three actionable takeaways that you can implement in your life right away to start beating modern lifestyle diseases. You can chat directly with our guest experts here on Zoom or follow us on live stream via Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We are working with our guest today, Dr. Hans Steele, to bring you the patient's quick guide to lifestyle medicine, which will be freely accessible on our website for the public and we aim for it to be available for healthcare professionals to distribute to their patients. If you're ready to implement your health goals, join our free membership on our website to be part of a very supportive community to learn and implement evidence-based healthy lifestyle habits to help you gain the health to live a long and fulfilling life. Oops. And today we have a returning guest, the stimulating, motivating and dynamic Dr. Han Steele, joining us again to give us the instruments of hope, health and healing. Instead of me giving him a lengthy introduction like I did last time, I'll let the well-respected Dr. John McDougall do it for us. So let me just play a video. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. been involved a little bit with these chip programs and they do exactly what needs to be done mm -hmm. they take people who are struggling uh, with, with with disease or they want to prevent disease and are you know hooked on the American diet don't know anything yeah. different sure. and they they teach them they give them community they give them support they give them success I mean it and for almost no money at all yeah. it's it's just an amazing program and uh, I Hans and I have been together for oh, probably 25 years and I've mm -hmm. seen his work and he's I would have to say he's done more and, and this is not an exaggeration he's done more to help people from around the world in a practical manner than anybody I know through these chip programs that's exciting no, I, 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 did, you, did, did you get that right uh, can you say that again? <laughs> Hans Deal Dr. Hans Deal has done more to help the average man and woman in this country yeah. Yeah. over over 25 years of work just getting it getting in their yeah. faces getting in their homes yeah. Yeah. and tell them that they don't have to be sick and then showing them how to do it through the mm -hmm. chip program <laughs> welcome dr hans oh thank you let's see what do we do now share the screen yes so we are going to share the screen uh, for your uh, brilliant presentation and um while we are doing that, just want to say hi to so many incredible uh, people who have joined us today from Philly, Mexico, Los Angeles, uh, wow, Minnesota. Um, Dr. Dr. Hansil, you are you have admirers from around the world. Well, thank you so much, and I, I feel very, I feel very fortunate that uh, some 30 years ago, I uh, found the concepts of lifestyle medicine. And uh, I began to realize that in medicine, we virtually have very little to offer in curing chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes and obesity and hypertension. Uh, we just cannot cure these diseases. These are chronic diseases with pills and procedures. These are chronic diseases. You die with these diseases regardless of the medical care that you have. But the good news is that uh, an enlightened, intelligent lifestyle and intelligent self-care can actually activate the body's innate ability to begin to heal itself. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk to you about uh, uh, how to cure incurable diseases with lifestyle medicine. And before I do this, I want to make a short 
review of what we talked about last time when I talked about uh, one of the major causes of our common chronic diseases has to be found in a diet that has gone crazy in Western society. And so last time we talked about fork and knife weapons of mass destruction, really. And what many people don't realize is that heart disease was very rare 100 years ago. Today, it's the most common disease around the world, the most common death around the world. And then we also begin to talk about the whole concept of what happened to the American chairs. Do you see those chairs there? They were 43 centimeters, 44 centimeters, 45 centimeters over a period of 70, 80 years. And suddenly something happened in the 1980s the diet began to change in America and began to change around the world. And then you begin to realize the chairs have gone big time to accommodate the American derriere. And with that, of course, you have to worry about diabetes has increased by 300% in the last 30 years. And high blood pressures have gone up, heart disease, arthritis, asthma, sleep apnea, and cancers, they're all indirectly related to and associated with the obesity issues in our society today. Look at breast cancer, 1960, one in 20 women, today, one in seven women. So the incidence has actually increased. And then we talked about the idea that the diet has changed dramatically. These are now the um, macronutrients here. On the left side, you see uh, a bar that's largely green, which uh, represents uh, common foods used in countries around the world where you don't have the money to take those foods and turn them into industrialized products. These are usually uh, foods that are high in complex carbohydrate, the rice and the beans and the uh, wheat. You know, these are the, the, the potatoes. These are foods that are used in countries around the world where you cannot find heart disease very easily. But then as you go to the right hand side, we talked about the idea as a country becomes more affluent, as more money is being invested in uh, taste sensations, shall we say. Uh, now you are changing everything. You no longer eat uh, the potatoes on the left side. You now go to the right hand side and you see the bar there, you eat now potato chips. You no longer eat corn on the left side. You move to the right, you eat corn chips. When you eat corn chips, that's 70% fat. When you eat potato chips, that's 70% fat. Potatoes then have very much fat. So you change everything. And with it, you now have a diet that is largely consistent of fats. You see the right and uh, pinkish color there. And then sugar. And then you have an increase in animal protein. And so this is then the American diet. And you have a little bit of green color, which is starch. And that starch is now totally refined starch, more or less. These are the white flour products like cakes and pies and these kind of things. Whenever you have this kind of a diet, you have to worry about these Western chronic diseases. So we talked about last time, two major dietary shifts. Shift number one, from whole food to industrialized products. We shifted from slow foods to fast foods, from eating at home to eating out. And with that, you have now increased dramatically the empty calories that are being provided by these engineered foods. They're no longer foods as they come in nature, but they're coming now out of factories. And this then leads to nutrient density loss. You're losing the nutrients that is in the original food and you're now concentrating the calories and now you have to deal with caloric density. So you have more calories coming in, you have to be concerned about overfeeding and undernutrition. This is the first shift here. You can see it, the total calories. 44% of the American calories eaten come from sugar, fats and oils and alcohol. No nutritional value, overfed and undernourished. Some powerful books have been written that talk about the idea of how the um, uh, processing food industry has figured out that if you put enough salt, sugar and fat into a product, that you can actually hijack the um, pleasure centers of the brain and you can no longer just settle for one chip. You've got to have the whole tube of Pringles. You've got to finish them up, right? This is now addiction that is in, in, inculcated very strategically by powerful industry groups. 
there you are, hooked. Yeah, hooked. And so to blame people for being obese is really a simplistic answer. We have to look into the context and contextualize it and recognize that there are food products out there that make it very difficult not to overeat. So that was the first major dietary shift from whole food to industrialized products, from potatoes to potato chips. And then number two, a major dietary shift was we increased our meat consumption, especially processed meats. And of course, there's now a direct relationship established uh, between processed meats and certain cancers. And uh, we also have recognized that uh, cheese uh, is today in America, at least, the number one source of saturated fat in the diet. And this is what's driving the high blood cholesterol levels. And this is then driving the atherosclerotic changes in the arteries. Here you see the second shift to animal products. We have gone from 56 kilograms per person per year to 91 kilograms. And this is then the great American diet, beware. Beware, please note, 55% of the calories here come from processed foods. They're refined, engineered. Then you have another 31% coming from dairy and animal foods. And then only, and this is the point I wanted to make last time, only 14% of the calories that we eat in America and in Western society, and now more and more around the world, comes from fruits, from vegetables, from whole grains, from legumes like beans and lentils and some nuts. These are the food that are provided by a master designer. These are the foods that are provided by nature. They represent now in our society only 14% of all the calories we eat. We're living on a very artificial diet. And of course, we are becoming more and more aware that whenever you have the introduction of these kind of foods that you always have to wait not very long for Western diseases. Western diets precede Western diseases. And we gave some examples last time, 1952, Japan, it was difficult to find heart disease in Japan. Today, it's the number two cause of death. China, 1978, difficult to find high cholesterol levels. Today, they're just like uh, here in America, Shanghai, Hong Kong, they're, they've become Westernized. And then we talked about Lithuania, a small country that used to be under the domination of the Soviet Union, became free in 1991, brought in the Western foods with democracy and everything else. And within the next 25 years, the death rates from heart disease doubled. They're so high now that they are twice as high as the death rates of heart disease here in America. And then uh, when I was in Saudi Arabia, I saw what happened there 20 years ago. People are standing in long, long lines waiting for their... McDonald's burgers. And so you have people like Dr. Willard from Harvard who have said epidemiologists, people that study the epidemic of these diseases, they have long known that the major determinants of our killer diseases today are dietary factors and lifestyle factors. And then we spent a little bit of time last time to talk about heart disease. Here you see the coronary artery sitting on top of the heart muscle. I first woke up, so to speak, when I was working on the anesthesia service, learning how to put people to sleep. And I was seeing my patients for the next day's surgery for coronary artery bypass surgery in order to bypass clogged arteries in their heart. Because it was late at night, I drew the man's blood test. And when I took the blood to the laboratory and had it processed, I couldn't believe my eyes. Now, normally, this liquid layer floating on top of the blood clot is quite transparent. It's a yellow, but quite clear. You can see right through it. The blood in this patient's tube, however, was anything but clear. The serum floating on his clot was thick and greasy white. It looked like glue. In fact, it stuck to the sides of the blood tube when I shook the tube. I went back to the patient. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital tonight? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized that what I was looking at in his tube was all the fat in the beef burger, all the butter fat in the cheese, and the butter fat in the ice cream, and in the milkshake. And all this fat had oozed out into his blood and actually turned his blood fatty. Well, 30, 40, 50 years of keeping your blood very fatty creates changes in the blood vessels that are very dangerous. 
Over the years, arteries can become clogged with fatty material. Then a blood clot can form, blocking the blood flow completely. If the artery leads to the heart, the lack of oxygen can cause heart muscle to die. That's a heart attack. If the clogged artery leads to the brain, the patient has a stroke. <clears throat> the next morning, we took Mr. Phillips to the operating room, and I put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest. And from these arteries, he began pulling out yellow, greasy deposits of fatty material called atherosclerosis. Did you see that? This is the underlying pathology for most of our circulation-related common killer diseases. And I'll come to that in just a minute to give you the full picture. Here you see what happens. The arteries become narrowed. It begins actually in utero, depending on the diet of the mother. And by the time a person is 45 years of age, you can be counting on 60% narrowing of the coronary arteries and the major arteries. And many times uh, people may have 70, 80, 90% narrowing of the coronary arteries without having any clue that the arteries are shutting down. Angina pain is usually a blessing because it lets you know that you have at least 70% narrowing of the coronary arteries that are beginning to affect your heart. Because say, you are lucky to have angina because now you know you can do something about it because my presentation today will focus on you can reverse this plaque buildup if you're prepared to make some simple changes in how you eat and how you restructure your life. This is the most uh, telling uh, concept here in that this um, atherosclerosis is really a very systemic issue. It affects all of the arteries. Uh, we have about 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels in our system, and the large vessels are affected by this disease process called atherosclerosis. And so then this expresses itself in uh, cognitive losses, hearing loss, visual loss, uh, heart disease problems, kidney disease, uh, your femoral arteries that begin to shut down, uh, penal arteries, impotence, you know, all these things are related to this one underlying pathology called atherosclerosis. Here you see it again, heart disease, angina, cerebral infarction, senility, hearing loss, visual loss, hypertension, gangrene, impotence, claudication, they're all interrelated. It's basically one disease called inflammatory aspects of atherosclerosis. And what is driving this disease? Well, this is the risk arch here. Look at the three top uh, factors there. The closer these factors are to the top, the more powerful they are in driving this underlying disease process. And the number one factor here is LDL cholesterol and then high blood pressure and smoking. These are the three big factors. And of course, then you have diabetes, obesity, triglycerides, and inactive lifestyle, stress, and so on. So we talked about this and we give you an example. If you have a very high cholesterol of 8.0, you have a high blood pressure, you're a smoker, you have diabetes, you didn't pass a treadmill test, you're 35, year, 35 years of age, male. The chance of a heart attack in six years with this red profile is 140 times more likely to happen than if you have the ideal numbers for cholesterol such as 4.0 or less, Ideal blood pressure, no smoking, no diabetes, and no treadmill test uh, failed. 140 times. And we can change these risk factors. We can do something about cholesterol, about high blood pressure, about diabetes, about obesity, about triglycerides. They're all diet related. You can do something about smoking. You can do something about inactivity. And you can hopefully do something about your stress. So if you can modify these kind of things, you can actually dramatically not only lower the risk for heart disease and many of these red diet, uh, the uh, circulation related diseases, but you can actually reverse these processes. Here's Dr. Connor. Uh, as far back as 1992, uh, this professor said, if ever a human disease can be produced in animals, if you want to produce heart disease in animals, it's very easy. All you have to do is give them a high cholesterol and saturated fat diet. <clears throat> 
And so now I want to take you to where I live. This is where I'm at in Loma Linda, in California. <clears throat> uh, our snow, of course, is gone now, but this is the medical center there. And this is the center of the Adventist Health Study, one of the most respected uh, observational studies ever done. The government recently provided $25 million to Loma Linda University to uh, do another study. And they looked at 100,000 Adventists in North America, uh, and they followed them for seven years, and they began to document the changes that took place in their health. Adventists are known for being a fairly conservative uh, a Christian uh, denomination. There are about 20 million people around the world, and uh, they're known for being non-smokers, and usually they don't use alcohol. They also are very educationally oriented, and um, uh, they have a strong social structure and support network. Here was the first study that, it, that preceded the big 100,000 person study. Here you see uh, they compared um, Adventists with Californians. And you can see here if the Californians all suffer from a deadly heart attack, it's only 64% of the Adventists who are meat eaters. It's only 40% of the Adventists that are like to over vegetarians. And it's only 23% of the Adventists that are pure vegetarians. So if you wanted to reduce the likelihood of uh, fatal heart disease, what are the lessons here? Well, you know, Californians are usually uh, carnivorous. They're also smokers. And so Adventists are not in that category, especially as uh, uh, pure vegetarians. And uh, you can see the more you move towards a more plant-based diet, the less meat, the less animal products, the lower the lake likelihood of fatal heart disease. And so this is then the big study here that just came out, seven year follow up of 100,000 Seventh day Adventists in North America. This is for women. You notice here, those in the red bar, these are the Adventists that are meat eaters, 82 kilograms on the average they weigh. Then you go to the, um, the uh, uh, yellow formed on the left hand side, 73 kilograms. These are lacto over vegetarians. They don't eat meat, but they eat dairy and eggs. And then you go to the green bar. These are now the pure vegetarians. Here, the women are on the average 64 kilos. The difference between meat eating Adventists and uh, vegetarian Adventists then is about, you can see, uh, almost 20 kilograms, right? Yeah. So if you wanted to do something about your weight, move towards the green category. Men, same story, meat eating Adventists weigh on the average 88 kilograms, uh, plant food oriented Adventists only 73. So again, it's about 15 kilograms difference. Again, you wanna do something about your weight, move towards uh, less animal products. And then you look at diabetes, the Adventist uh, meat eaters, uh, you can see on the right hand side, 6.3% of them were diagnosed uh, as uh, diabetics on medication, most of them, and only 1.6% among the plant food eating Adventists. Hypertension, same story, 19% of the Adventists are on blood pressure medication. Uh, and uh, on the left hand side, you look at the uh, plant food oriented Adventists, only 5%. Same thing for cholesterol, Cholesterol numbers are uh, on people on uh, medication for cholesterol. Among the Adventists, the meat-eating Adventists are 15% versus 3%, five times more commonly found in the uh, meat-eating Adventists when compared to the plant food-oriented Adventists. And in general, we can say when we go beyond the Adventists, we look at all the data that we have uh, uh, in the medical journals, uh, uh, probably uh, most of our common uh, killer diseases are totally preventable to a large extent. Uh, stroke 70%, cancer 71%, heart disease 82%, and probably 91% of the diabetes type 2 is preventable and perhaps even reversible if people would make some lifestyle changes. So the experts are then telling us that probably 80% of our chronic disease in the United States, and that probably holds for the UK as well, doesn't it, could be prevented by making significant changes in diet and lifestyle. And here's this famous uh, British uh, uh, physician 
Dr. Dennis Burkett. We all know him in the medical uh, arena as uh, the man who uh, discover, discovered a lymphoma in Africa that is named after him, the Burkitt lymphoma. I had the privilege of working with this gentleman for several years. And he said, even as far back as 1992, when he received the equivalent of the American Nobel Prize, he said the greatest medical discovery of the last 25, 20 years. The last 20, he said that in 1992. So he said, the most important discovery of the last 20 years was the understanding that our modern chronic diseases are largely lifestyle related. And if they are, then they must be preventable and reversible. And so that brings me then to our topic today, reversibility of chronic diseases. Incurable diseases curable? By making some lifestyle changes? Because we can't do it with the traditional high-tech tools in our medical toolbox. Pills and procedures are not curing these diseases. We can slow them down, perhaps. We can make you feel better. We can take care of the symptoms, the pain, but we're not curing these diseases. That has to take place from within. It has to come from the person. These are lifestyle-related diseases. And so I want to recommend, I want to introduce to you the most powerful instruments of hope, health, and healing. Fork and knife. Surprised? Mm, let's take a look. Let me take you to uh, our former president, President Bill Clinton. 2004, quadruple corner bypass surgery. Six years later, the bypass is clogged up again. Angina has come back. Now he has some stenting and he is concerned. He thought he was cured. I mean, he had a $150,000 surgery. He had a bypass surgery. This should have taken care of things. I was lucky I didn't die of a heart attack. Former President Clinton, like Some too many people, people was busy. And for years, he ignored warning signs from his heart. But in 2004, during an exhausting book tour, there was something different. I had a real tightness in my chest when I was getting off the airplane, and it was the only time I'd had it unrelated to exercise. We're here outside New York Presbyterian Hospital in just a couple of hours. President Bill Clinton, former president, is uh, scheduled to undergo surgery. So I immediately went down to our local hospital and they uh, did a test. They said, you got real problems. They hustled me down to Columbia Presbyterian and uh, they confirmed the uh, determination that I had serious blockage and needed the surgeries. The doctors immediately knew options were limited. The 58-year-old Clinton needed to have his chest open, his heart stopped, and surgery performed. There's no medical treatment for reversing the obstructions that have already formed in his blood vessels. I got Hillary and Chelsea there, and all I remember is it was happening fast, and everybody who cared about me was scared, and I felt rather serene. I thought, oh, gosh, we dodged a bullet. I didn't have a heart attack. On Labor Day in 2004, Mr. Clinton had four blood vessels bypassed. Starting this morning around 8 o'clock, he had a relatively routine quadruple bypass operation. Uh, we left the operating room around noon, and he is recovering normally at this point. So I think right now everything looks straightforward. Okay, you heard the surgeon, we have no cure for heart disease. And then the cardiologist uh, uh, in a press conference uh, made it very clear that uh, this uh, recurrence of heart disease uh, that came back six uh, years later with chest pain, he said this was not his diet. Now you have to understand that the American president was well known as being a real junk food eater. He loved his uh, McDonald's. He loved his junk foods. Uh, and, uh, but 
this cardiologist now came to his rescue and said, by the way, no, 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 no. Uh, this recurrence of heart disease is not the result of his lifestyle or his diet. We have to remember that heart disease is a chronic condition. We don't have a cure for these conditions, but we have excellent treatments. Well, what are the excellent treatments if you cannot cure the disease? See here, medical technology has excellent treatments for acute care, for episodic diseases, for emergency care. Oh yeah, perfect. We could do fabulous diagnostic things, but when it comes to chronic disease, cures are rare and elusive. These are incurable chronic diseases, but we can do something about them. But people don't know this. They think the answers will come from well-trained physician at the best hospital with the best equipment. And so we look for bypass surgery. In America, we do about almost half a million surgeries of this kind a year at about $150,000 a surgery. Uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, no awareness that probably uh, 38 to 46 percent, you can see it right there, of these saphenous grafts are no longer working within 12 to 18 months. The problem with bypass surgery is that these arteries begin to clog up again because we have not made the underlying uh, needed uh, lifestyle changes. As a matter of fact, the very best estimates are that only about 10% of heart attack patients have their life actually extended after bypass surgery. And that's why Newsweek, this big uh, weekly magazine in 2011 had this cover on its um, issue there, one word that will save your life. And I thought to myself, oh my, what are they doing now? Putting down modern medicine? One word, what is the one word? And then they said it has two letters, two letters, one word that will save your life. What would it be? The word is N-O. No, probably 80% or more of our bypass surgeries are done on the mistaken notion that you will live a longer life. You may, if you accompany the surgery, if it's a life-threatening situation with a powerful revising of your lifestyle. Of course, then you have angioplasties, these stents. We do about a million for this here in, in this country. Again, uh, $35,000 is if everything goes well. And yet, uh, they have never been shown when you have a person with stable angina that they will add anything to your lifespan. The problem then with bypass surgery and also with angioplasties in a very special way is the restenosis or the closing again of the, uh, the grafted vessels and the native uh, circulation as well. This is the Achilles heel of mechanical arterial interventions. We need to open up the arteries from the inside through dietary and lifestyle means. And that's the whole concept of lifestyle medicine. That's why lifestyle medicine today is the fastest growing medical subspecialty in America and in many, many countries around the world. We begin to realize that we have to empower people to make some lifestyle changes because that's what drives the disease. And so the president uh, got some more counsel and he found out that, uh, well, if I get these stents now, will they then save my life? And the uh, cardiologist told him, well, listen, you have to understand uh, uh, that this is just sort of a tune-up. Uh, you're gonna come back in a few months, maybe in a few years, uh, because uh, these uh, stents don't last either. And so this president then began to look for other means. If I take the statin drugs, would that help me? He already had a heart, heart attack, you see, he had heart disease. And so for secondary prevention, if I take the statin drugs to lower my cholesterol, would that help me? And the answer is yes, you can reduce all cause mortality. The death from all causes by about 14%, it has its place. On the other hand, uh, the question was asked, what happens if you give these statin drugs to lower cholesterol to people who have not had a heart disease and they want to prevent the disease? You do it as a coronary risk reduction measure. And so they uh, 
did some fairly uh, substantial studies, uh, and here's the answer. This is the editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association. No evidence was found for any benefit of statin drugs on all cause mortality in this high risk primary prevention setting in this four year follow up study. They took 100 men and they gave them these statin drugs for five years at a cost of a half a million dollars. And at the end of five years, they found that they were able, hello, that they were able to maybe prevent one or two heart attacks in these 100 men over a period of five years. And then the editorial in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association said, a healthy lifestyle is the answer. A simple diet and daily exercise. And you know, we are recognizing that it's also true for diabetic drugs. They don't really, really turn the disease off. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if you're very aggressively using these blood sugar lowering medications, you have actually a very good chance that you increase heart disease, death, and premature, yeah, premature death. The Accord study was an absolute um, mind-blowing uh, uh, study, which had to be discontinued uh, uh, before it was supposed to be finished because there were excessive number of deaths in the patients, in these diabetic patients, who were given maximum medication to uh, hopefully create the best results. The results, premature death, increasingly so. And then you look at uh, medication that you take for high blood pressure. Again here, uh, when you have uh, a diagnosis of high blood pressure, you take one drug and after a couple of months of physician as well, uh, you know, uh, this doesn't really work too well. You had some side effects. Uh, uh, you know, you had some problems with impotence and other things too. Uh, we'll give you another medication. So you take another drug, you take another drug, you take another drug, and after three, four months, you take a second drug and a third drug and a fourth drug and all designed to bring the blood pressure down. And do you save a person from a stroke? Do you save a person from a heart attack? Well, it can help with the strokes. There's no effect on the death from heart disease. And here you see the usual uh, 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 advice. Uh, this patient uh, reports, my doctor told me I would probably take the blood pressure pills for the rest of my life because they don't cure. And yet we have this idea in the population for every ill, there's a pill <laughs> and nobody wants to pay the bill, right? And so here's a, a very a well formulated statement um, from two physicians reporting the New England Journal of Medicine. With the advent of direct-to-consumer advertising for pharmaceuticals for drugs and surgical procedures in America, cultural expectations of immediate simplistic solutions have been bolstered by consumerism and fully exploited to generate demand for therapies that are, yeah, often marginally indicated and potentially unsafe. This is America. Number one cause of death in America, heart disease and stroke. Number two cause of death, cancer. Number three cause of death, prescription drugs. 11% of all American deaths are related to prescription drugs. We need to have a greater respect for the medications. When you have some uh, infectious disease, when you have uh, a need for some uh, a pain relief, of course, uh, we want to be grateful for the medications that we have available. Uh, but when it comes to chronic disease, we should be much more reluctant in jumping onto the bandwagon of multi, multiple medications. Uh, instead, we should ask, is there anything that I can do? Could I lose weight? Could I get into an exercise program? Can I change my diet and bring up my cholesterol down by 20 to 25% in just 30 days through diet? Yeah, but this is what we do. We've been caught up by this, by this idea. You, what do you see there? Tell me, what do you see? Well, there's water on the floor and there's a group of well-trained people. They're all well-masked 
and they're trying to frantically try to keep the floor dry, to get it dry and keep it dry. They're even passing out uh, color-coded umbrellas for patients that you see there um, to keep them dry. What's wrong with the picture? What's wrong with the, uh, with the uh, concept here? What do we really need? Do we need more physicians to clean up? Do we need more technology? Or do we need a plumber to take care of the cause? See, this is a challenge when it comes to dealing with chronic disease. We need to begin to focus on the cause of these diseases. And we already talked about the idea that these are lifestyle related factors where probably diet plays a very prominent uh, primary role. <clears throat> and with this kind of disease epidemic, you see a dramatic increase in the amount of money spent on medical care. 1960, take a look there, you see 5%. 5% of the income in America was spent on medical care. You move to 2020, most re more recently, now it's almost 20% of our income in America is spent on taking care of medical issues. And ladies and gentlemen, please note, you see the little red square up there, US medical cost trends, medical spending in billions of dollars. Here's the point, 86% of our medical money in America is spent on managing the symptoms of chronic disease. We do not cure, but we make you feel better. 86% is spent on managing the symptoms of chronic disease. We need to do better. We need to become involved. We can turn this thing around. You can turn it around. You can turn it around with lifestyle medicine specialists by your side, like uh, Dr. Linda, and Dr. Erica, they have been trained that we need to empower people very systematically, very carefully, in a, in a very caring, supportive manner. We need to make efforts to transform our society. We need to make foods available in restaurants that are more uh, health related. We need to make foods available in stores. In, 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 we need to change the society because otherwise people just fall into these traps and they don't know how to get out and they think, well, the doctors will take care of me. Yeah, we wish that was true when it comes to chronic diseases. So let me just give you some data here. This is the European wartime. Um, just to give you an idea, 1939, 1940, the Nazi armies invade Norway. Uh, they take all the livestock uh, to feed their soldiers and the population has to grow their own food and live on basically a plant food, whole food diet. They have to grow it in their own garden. And you see what happens to the uh, rate of circulatory deaths in Norway. Very quickly, within a year's time, and you see it drops and drops and drops and drops down to 1944, 1945. Uh, the death rate from uh, heart disease and strokes dramatically declined in Norway as it did in other European countries where the occupational forces of the Nazis usually uh, took all the, uh, the livestock and left the people having to live on very simple foods. The Nazis finally left. The, 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 the war is over, 1945. And what happens? The diseases are coming back very rapidly. So the question is, did we really regress? Did we really reverse the atherosclerotic plaque? The evidence is very clear uh, from studies done in the 1945 to 1950 uh, that the plaques reversed themselves, but then came back with a vengeance. Here's Dr. Castelli from the fr famous Framingham study in New York, Boston. He said, if you want to reverse coronary artery disease, if you want to reverse the atherosclerotic plaque in the arteries, in monkeys, all you have to do is feed them a simple, very low fat, natural, whole food diet. Remember, <laughs> that's the kind of foods that I showed you earlier that represent only 14% of all the calories that we eat in America. If you take this very simple diet, foods as grown, and you feed it to monkeys whom you have first introduced to heart disease by feeding them the typical American diet with a lot of cholesterol and saturated fat and so on. 
You can actually create this disease in these monkeys. You have them about 90% narrow at the arteries, and then you've put them on a very simple diet, a simple low fat natural whole food diet. And within two years, the monkeys have the arteries beginning to open up very nicely again. Well, that's monkeys. What about humans? You may have heard of Dr. Dean Ornish, a man that is probably in line for a Nobel Prize. 1990, he shook up the medical establishment in that he took 48 heart disease patients. Half of them he put on a very simple vegetarian diet, very, very little oil, uh, virtually no oil, very simple uh, diet. Foods has grown, the 14% fed diet that I showed you earlier. And then he compared these uh, heart disease patients with another group that were uh, randomly allocated to the usual care. They received the American Heart Association diet, which means they could have 30% fat instead of 70% fat, 7% fat in the Ornish program. And they were allowed to have their allotment of meats. Uh, uh, it was sort of an improvement to the American diet, but not all that much. And here you see the results after one year, Ornish published it in the Lancet Medical Journal, the famous British medical journal. He published the results. Uh, the cholesterol with the diet that he used uh, and his lifestyle interventions was 20 24% lower. And the usual care program that was prescribed by the physicians in general, it was only 5%, didn't make any difference. And please note, the plaque regressed. The plaque began to, uh, began to become less and less and less inside the arteries in 82% of the cases. Regression of atherosclerosis is very clearly a possibility. While on the American Heart Association diet, the red uh, bar there, 53% of the people actually had an increase in atherosclerosis. So, you know, you really want to do the right thing. Don't play around with these things and say, well, you know, I have usually six uh, omelets uh, a week and I only have one omelet, it's not gonna do it. You say, well, I used to have uh, uh, a 12 ounce uh, steak you know, that's a big steak, uh, two or three times a week. Uh, uh, you know, maybe I just have one once a week. It's not gonna do it. If you really wanna turn this disease around, you have to remove the stimulants for it. And here you see the results from our CHIP program. Uh, this is now a program uh, where we are uh, enrolling people uh, in an ambulatory set setting. And um, we have uh, close to 100,000 people that we have had in our program that I developed some 30 years ago. And uh, uh, you see the results here. These are people that come to about 19 lectures, uh, night after night after night. Uh, and uh, then they make some lifestyle changes. And you can see here, uh, the patients that had cholesterol levels over 7.0, their drop was 20% in 30 days. And you say, well, what does that mean? <laughs> that means everything. Let me tell you what that means. For every percent drop in your cholesterol, now here the drop was 20%. For every drop in cholesterol in your bloodstream, you lower your coronary risk, your risk of heart attack by two and a half times. So let's think about this. For 1% drop in blood cholesterol, two and a half percent drop in coronary risk. In our CHIP program, we have on the average a 20% drop in the high cholesterol numbers and times two and a half, that means 50% reduction in heart disease. That means in 30 days, or we sometimes run the program 10 weeks now, uh, in, in 10 weeks, you can actually cut your risk of heart attack in half just by making a change in your cholesterol. Here's Dr. Dean Ornish making the front cover of Newsweek. It says uh, he has shown scientifically that people can open their blocked arteries without drugs or surgery. He guides them through a rigorous lifestyle program. And then uh, I want you to meet my dear friend, Dr. Colwes Asselstein at the famous Cleveland Clinic. He had 18 coronary patients and he single-handedly as a surgeon, he changed his career and became an educator and he took these, uh, his heart, he took heart disease patients that came to him. They were the walking dead. And he said, I want you to make some changes. Are you prepared? Yes. And he gave them a five hour presentation with his wife 
of how to change the disease of heart disease. And he put them on a very simple whole food, plant-based, very low-fat diet. He didn't say anything about exercise, didn't say anything about smoking. He said, I just wanted to see if, if diet itself could actually reverse this disease process, which has become the number one killer in our society. And here he took 18 coronary patients, the walking dead. They already had heart disease. They had already had the bypass surgery or stents at the fa famous Cleveland Clinic. They had been seen for eight years in the Department of Cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic. And during that eight years, these heart disease patients on the average had a cholesterol of 6.0. During that time, they also had 49 cardiovascular events. They had heart attacks, they had strokes, they had bypass surgeries, and, and, and because remember, being taken care of by the best cardiologist does not necessarily prevent and avoid these kind of diseases. Because remember, we have no cure for heart disease in the medical armamentarium. We don't have any tools in the toolbox, in the medical toolbox to do something about this. So these people now are enrolled by Dr. Esselstein. These people presumably have about six months to live. They are a high risk for anything to happen. They come to him. And he says, I want you to follow a very simple diet. I want you to really cut back on the oils and the fats and the sugars and the salt. I want you to eat real food, food as it comes in nature, green vegetables, kale and broccoli and, and grains and beans. And uh, I want you to really, in, and, and they said, well, sir, uh, <laughs> we're not used to these kind of foods and uh, uh, I don't think I have any appetite for these. Oh, he said, don't worry. Once you have been brainwashed by my wife and me, once you understand what causes this disease and you want to live and you want to see your grandchildren graduate, don't you? Once you understand this, your mind begins to control and interpret your taste buds, what happens there. And you will develop a new taste orientation. You will develop a new value system for taste and you will enjoy these foods that at this time seem to be a little bit outlandish. And here you see the results over the next five years. 18 coroner patients. <laughs> five years later, they're still all alive. They haven't died. But also notice their cholesterol is now on the average 3.5. Not one coronary event, not one stroke, not one bypass, not one stent. And 73%, they documented the arteries had begun to open up again. And then he continues the study with these people another seven years. So this is now 12 years follow-up study. The patients are maintaining their simple lifestyle, uh, simple foods. Uh, uh, the cholesterol is maintained at 3.6 in 12 years, not one heart attack, not one stroke, not one need for bypass or stent. Folks, this is a revolution. Please note, in the time when these people were 12, 15 years younger, the red bar there, their cholesterol, they were seen by the best cardiologists perhaps in America at the Cleveland Clinic, but their cholesterol was kept at 6.0 because no one really seemed to have succeeded to help these people to understand that they need to get their cholesterol down. And you can do it now with medication, but you can do it primarily through a dietary and general lifestyle. Regression. Well, actually, uh, Dr. Esselstyn started with 24 coronary patients. 18 stayed in the program for 12 years, uh, no cardiovascular events, no disease uh, uh, events, but six dropped out. This, uh, this is too difficult. This is, uh, you know, I, uh, no, I, I don't want to do it. And so over the next 12 years, they followed them up and these six people had 13 cardiovascular events. The way you live is the way you die to a large extent. There's a close relationship there. There's a close association there. And here you see some of the angiograms. This is now looking at x-rays of the coronary arteries. This is one of the major coronary arteries uh, that are feeding the heart muscle. And you see on the left side, uh, you see the circled area. There's very little blood going through the uh, artery there on the right. And so the person obviously has uh, angina problems uh, on the right hand side. The same patient, the same doctor who refused to have bypass surgery, but he came to Dr. Esso and said, listen, I don't want the surgery. Tell me what I have to do. How many carrots do I have to eat? How much broccoli do I have to eat? Tell me, I'm gonna do it. He did. This is two and a half years later on the right-hand side. 
the artery is totally restored, no medication, just diet, diet therapy, powerful. And then people said, well, this is just 12 patients. Uh, Ornish had about 28 patients. Uh, uh, what about uh, uh, larger groups of people? So Dr. Esselstyn followed up 198 patients. You see on the number two listed there, Dr. Esselstyn followed up uh, for, for four years, 198 heart disease patients that had gone through his programs, that had received the five-hour counsel experience, and 89% of these people after four years were still in the program. 11% <clears throat> not. So now Dr. Esselstyn compared the outcome, the health outcome between the 89% that followed the program and the 11% who did not. Well, let's take a look. Those who followed the program over the next four years, those 89% of the people, only 0.6% of these people, that was one person who had a heart attack. But among those 11% who didn't follow the program, there were 62% had heart disease problems, had recurrent events, which means the differential was 100 fold. Is it worthwhile to maybe following a simple dietary program, which becomes very delightful as your taste buds begin to change? It takes about two to three weeks. And so Dr. Esselstyn uh, wrote in one of his uh, journal articles, he said stents and bypasses have that place, especially when you have an emergency. Yeah, of course, if you have a heart attack, of course, this is the way to go. Uh, this is not the time for broccoli, no, no, no. However, research, he says, makes it very clear that the elective application, you really don't need it. It's not a matter of life and death, it does not prolong life and it does not protect you from heart attacks. In contrast, a plant-based nutrition, which treats the disease causation, can arrest and reverse cardiovascular illness and stop the epidemic. Folks, this is a seismic revolution and it's cost effective. You don't pay $150,000 here in America for this kind of a thing. You have to eat anyway. I mean, you buy foods as grown, it costs you 35 to 45% less than if you eat all the junk food and these processed food. All right, so can you cure heart disease just with food. The question might seem strange, but uh, our Dr. Sanjay Gupta has living proof of it. It is part of his fantastic special report called The Last Heart Attack, which you can see this weekend on CNN. Sanjay joins us live from Atlanta now. Sanjay, you spent the last year looking into heart attack uh, and heart disease for your special. Uh, you have a, a history of it in your family, and you've really studied how people can get away from that and get out from under that. What if you don't want to use medicine, statins, to reduce your risk of heart attack. Can you really use food as medicine? Well, you know, it, it's interesting, Al, yeah, Hippocrates has talked about this for more than a thousand years, in the, and I walked into this with an open mind, but the answer is definitely uh, yes, you can. And we did find li living proof of this. Uh, Sh Sharon Kintz is a woman that we uh, profiled, 66 years old, had a heart attack, was told by her doctor she needed to have heart surgery, uh, and she said no. And she said, and she basically adopted this plant-based diet as you can see there, uh, she's been very strict about it, uh, you know, whole grains, lots of vegetables, been doing it for over a year. And it, it's quite remarkable, not only in how much she has not uh, had any symptoms of heart problems, but also in terms of her energy levels. And this is something that I, you know, really focused on with her. Uh, she could barely walk before all of this. And, and literally now, uh, you know, a year later on this plan, based diet she's she's able to jump rope i mean t take a look at that ali she, she couldn't do that before and i'm not saying that obviously being on a plant-based diet taught her how to jump rope but people always question do you have enough energy still on one of these diets right. and we profiled her just just to demonstrate all right so so this it's a pretty serious diet it's a pretty pretty extreme way to go is there science that proves it's working other than the fact that she can drum, jump rope and rope and she's fit well, you know, the, the, yes, the, there's, a, there's a couple of different things. First of all, you know, people really oftentimes want objective signs to show that there's, there's changes in someone's blood vessels. And we talked about this before, Ali, not just in terms of showing a slowing of heart disease, but an actual reversing of heart disease. In order to prove that, a patient would have to undergo another angiogram. Sharon's doing so well, she, she said she had no need to go undergo an angiogram. But let me show you a patient who did do that. And this is over a period of a few years. 
Uh, take a look over here, and I don't know if you can appreciate this where the arrow is. This is a coronary blood vessel, and this is what one of those narrowings looks like. This is what a heart attack waiting to happen looks like. This is someone who decided not to undergo surgery, which was recommended, instead using food as medicine. And take a look now over here, uh, same spot, and that, that coronary blood vessel is essentially, uh, you know, it's opened up. It's about the same normal caliber as the rest of the blood vessel. That is sort of what we're talking about here, Ali, in terms of, uh, you know, providing some sort of objective evidence. Remarkably, despite the fact that, you know, again, Hippocrates has talked about this for over a thousand years, uh, this is still a relatively nascent science. I think more yep. studies are going to be done. You can see more images like that. How did you lose so much weight? Uh, what kind of diet are you on? Well, <clears throat> my, uh, the short answer is I went on essentially a plant-based diet. I live on uh, uh, beans, legumes, vegetables, fruit, no dairy, and it changed my whole metabolism, and I lost 24 pounds, and I got back to basically what I weighed in high school. But I did it for a different reason. I mean, I wanted to lose a little weight, but I didn't ever dream this would happen. I did it because after I had this stent put in, I realized that even though it happens quite often that after you have bypasses, you lose the veins because they're thinner and weaker than arteries. The truth is that it clogged up, which means that the cholesterol was still calling buildup in my vein that was part of my bypass. And thank God I could take the stents. I don't want it to happen again. So I did all this research and I saw that 82% of the people since 1986 who have gone on a plant-based, no dairy, no meat of any kind, no chicken, turkey, if you can do it, 82% of the people who've done that have begun to heal themselves. Their arterial blockage <coughs> cleans up. The calcium deposit around their heart breaks up. This movement has been led by a doctor named Caldwell Esselstein at the Cleveland Clinic, Dean Ornish, whom you know, out in California, the doctors Campbell, father and son, who wrote the China study, and a handful of others. But we now have 25 years of evidence. And so I thought, well, since I need to lose a little weight for Chelsea's wedding, I'll become part of this experiment. I'll see if I can be one of those that can have a self-clearing mechanism. And there you see a man that was not known for his uh, uh, dietary purity is now practicing a new entertainment dietary lifestyle. Especially, particularly after he saw the film Forks Over Knives, which is incidentally an outstanding film. Uh, it's, uh, it's a game changer. And uh, the president saw it. And that was enough for him. He made his move. And uh, he has been following this program now. Uh, you know, this is now 19, 2012 for the last almost 10 years. But it's not only heart disease, but you know, I can also talk to you about diabetes. Uh, you can use a low fat plant-based diet on diabetes type two. Here's Dr. Singh. This goes back to 1955. We have known this since 1927 actually. And the data has been coming in and in and in and in. Ah, but somehow we were enamored with the insulin and the medications and we pushed those and uh, it was easy to prescribe. And it's so difficult to really, yeah, we always thought it was difficult to change people's lives. It's not. If you really help a person understand that this is the answer and you put your whole belief system behind it with conviction, people begin to make those changes. They listen to you as a doctor. So 1955, Inder Singh, he took 80 diabetics. He put them on a very low fat diet. Remember the diet today in England and in America is probably more like 35% of the calories is fat. This is an 11 fat diet, this very, very low fat diet, and it's all natural whole foods. 80 diabetics, within six weeks, 50 out of 80 type two diabetics were no longer on insulin because their diabetes had reversed itself. After a total of 18 weeks, 85% of all of these diabetics no longer were on medication because the blood sugar levels had normalized themselves. We see in our CHIP program, the complete health improvement program, we see in the CHIP program changes within two and three and four days where the physician then has to reduce the medication because the blood sugar levels go down so quickly.
In our chip program, you see, uh, we had uh, in this study, we had 525 diabetics. Uh, they were not taking medications yet, but they were diabetics. And we put them into a 30 day chip program. And after 30 days, there were only 301 people still testing as being diabetics. So this is a 40% uh, improvement, 40% of the diabetics were no longer in the diabetic range. Their blood sugars had normalized. For pre-diabetes, which precedes obviously diabetes, we had 390 patients like this. And after just 30 days, they were only 84 still pre-diabetic. So they had removed the, the danger, the threat of becoming full-blown diabetics within 30 days. And here's Dr. Anderson, a personal friend of mine, who as far back as 1980, when he spoke here at the university, said some 50 to 75% of the type two diabetics on insulin. These are insulin using diabetics. And 80 to 90% of those on pills could normalize their blood sugars and be off medication and injections within weeks if they changed their diet. Yeah, that's what we do in the CHIP program. We put these people on a, on a program where you have most of the foods coming from fruits and the calories come from fruits and vegetables and whole grains, whole grains and lots of beans and some nuts. This is a diet that reduces the intake of fats and oil and grease, which is now the new concept that this is more important than worrying about a little bit of sugar coming into the system. We need to let go of the sugar, of course, too. But what is much more important is to reduce the dram dramatically the large intake of fat, oil, and grease in the diet. High blood pressure here again. This is coming from a live-in center where I worked. Uh, uh, we had uh, a 200. We had we had actually we had almost no, yeah 598 patients that were high blood pressure on medication. Please note, um, after just 30 days, 55% of these high blood pressure patients on medication were no longer on medication because the blood, blood pressures dropped so low, it would have been dangerous keeping them on medication. Of course, another 45% stayed on medication because they needed a little bit more time to affect these changes. And here with the CHIP program, again, you see, we had 210 patients that were uh, really high in their blood pressure. And after just 30 days, there were only 69 patients still in this category, which means that we had a 67% success rate. My name is Joe Monaco, and prior to the CHIP program, my life was basically starting to spiral down with one kidney. I lost my kidney 20 years ago. I've had diabetes for over 10 years. I really owe this CHIP program uh, for turning my life around. Around the world, um, there is a, a pandemic issue. Lifestyle diseases are taking over. When we look at the disease burden in the United States and more and more around the world, uh, what we see is that it's chronic disease. It's these non-communicable diseases that stay with people for weeks, months, years, even decades. Being a medical doctor, knowing a lot about medication and drugs. I'm not against conventional medicine. I really feel it has its role, but we know that when it comes to lifestyle, conventional medicine doesn't do very well because we treat the, the results. We're not actually managing the cause. And this is where CHIP is so incredibly powerful. My husband joined the group, uh, which surprised me because he's been a butcher all his life. He actually lost 10 kilos in the first four weeks. What a joy to see someone respond in a way that our medication can't fix. CHIP can be the connection um, for people that don't believe that they can do better to become whole person health warriors. And I think that's what CHIP is all about. 
these are things that I want for my patients. And to be able to do that um, with this natural, holistic approach rather than prescribing a pill, uh, it's to me, it's the best thing in the world. The transformation of life that I witness, um, I mean, this is priceless. There is nothing that could buy that. I think we've realized when we look at uh, health and wellness that there's the mental aspect and the spiritual aspect. And if you don't address those issues, often people don't really get as well or improve as much as they should. And that's been the joy of running a CHIP program that is so balanced the way CHIP is presented. My world is better. So as we come to the end of our program, let me take the last five minutes and to perhaps uh, make some of the recommendations of how to uh, provide uh, uh, a high probability of being able to curing incurable diseases through intelligent self-care uh, provided and supervised by physicians that have gone to additional training to become lifestyle medicine specialists who are now understanding nutrition, which we don't really teach in medical school. They understand health psychology, which we don't really teach in medical school, that understand the importance of exercise, which we don't really teach in medical school. Uh, we have fallen into the trap of meeting the expectations of the culture that says, just give me something quickly, give me a pill and I'm out of here. But it doesn't work. Recommendations. We need a new cow. Yeah, that's right. We need a cow made from new substance of uh, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. This is what uh, Harvard Medical School recommends. Um, Vegetables, this is the plate, lots of vegetables, lots of green vegetables, vegetables in general, fruits, whole fruits, not fruit juices, whole grains, not white flour type stuff, and healthy protein, which means if there is some chicken or some fish there, but it should really come largely from uh, the potatoes and especially uh, legumes like beans and, and uh, lentils, you never have to worry about having a protein shortage when it comes to moving towards a vegetarian or plant-based diet, because all plants have some protein and there will always be more protein than you need. One of the greatest dangers today in our society is that we're taking in twice the amount of protein than we should have. And take a look, Harvard, no dairy. They recommend, we recommend water. <clears throat> There's no good reason <clears throat> to recommend a dairy like milk to prevent osteoporosis. As a matter of fact, countries with the most milk have the highest rates of osteoporosis and bone fractures. <clears throat> and here's the uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Dr. Neil Barnard. Again, they recommend this is what should, the plate should look like, vegetables, whole grains, fruits, and legumes. And this is how we put it into mathematical uh, numbers. <clears throat> You have the American, the American diet, the Western diet, where oils and fats are about 100 grams a day. We want to get down to 40 grams. Cholesterol is 400 milligrams. We want to get down to less than 50, ideally zero. So if you are on a plant-based diet, cholesterol is only found in animal products. So if you're on a plant-based diet, you don't have to worry about cholesterol in your blood, uh, except you have to worry about the saturated fat, all right? And that's usually found mostly in animal products and coconut oil and palm oil. When it comes to sugar, we are consuming 35 teaspoons. We probably should get down to less than 10 teaspoons. And we need to do something about our salt, cutting that in half. And when we use foods as grown, you get lots of fiber. 
instead of a measly 10 grams, you get about 30, 40, 50 grams of fiber. You don't have to worry about constipation anymore. You don't have to worry about the um, uh, problem of obesity. You don't have to worry about intestinal, gastrointestinal problems as much because the high fiber content will begin to be helpful in normalizing these situations. And of course, we recommend drinking plenty of fluids, particularly water. So the optimal diet then, we focus on whole foods, largely and preferably plant-based, that you can eat as much as you want as they are grown in, in, in nature and simply prepare it uh, without all the fats and oils and sugars and salt. And also try to stay away from refined processed foods. Just what Dr. Esselstyn did with his, you know, very, very sick heart disease patients. And if you want to, if you insist on eating animal products, well, then at least use them just as a seasoning or as a condiment. This is what we recommend. Lots of color. The more color, the more nutritional value. And in case you're not quite prepared to go all the way to a plant-based diet on the right-hand side here, where you have the best health outcome you see on the top. Well, why don't you go and take the British diet? Why don't you take the American diet? Why don't you take the Western diet, which consists largely of meats and dairy and eggs and processed foods, alcohol and caffeine, and you begin to move in the direction of the right-hand side. So you increase fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, some nuts and seeds and water. Now, if you happen to have a heart attack and you're on the left-hand side, you better jump all the way to the right-hand side where it's green. If you have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you better, and you're on the, on the left side and you're just worried just about the sugar. No, 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 no. Jump all the way to the right-hand side and you'll be okay. And if you have high blood pressure, again, if you're on the left side, jump to the right-hand side, really cut back on your salt in particular, and your blood sugars and blood pressures in this case will come down fairly quickly. Here are my last two or three slides. Eating a plant-based diet is really widening our circles of compassion. We're taking care of the animals now too. We're avoiding unnecessary pain, suffering, and death. Look at these three characters here. <laughs> these chi three chickens have a pretty good message for all of us. Eat more. <laughs> they have to take a spilling course. <laughs> Eat more kale. Yeah, that's right. Have a laugh and enjoy it, but there's much truth to that. And here's Dr. Dean Ornish. What's good for your health is also good for our planet. We're in planetary survival. And the animals will also thank you. Please remember, although heart disease and diabetes kill more people each year worldwide than all other diseases combined, these are completely preventable diseases. And these diseases are even reversible for at least 90% of the people today if they change their diet and lifestyle. So let me part with this suggestion. You see the logo on the right hand bottom side there, reversing modern killer diseases. Moving towards a plant-based whole food diet is a responsible, an enlightened choice on a planet that is fighting for its survival. Thank you very much. Wow. What an incredible presentation. Thank you so much. It's literally life-saving. I hope I gave you enough to think about. I mean, this is a presentation that covers a lot of details. But I wanted to give you some idea that there are libraries filled with scientific data that undergird some of the things that I've just sort of alluded to. All you have to do is get a book by Dr. Michael Greger called, what's the book title? How Not to Die. <laughs> How Not to Die. And Dr. Greger, five, 600 pages, with 2,500 scientific references and articles, documents, 
that you don't have to die from kidney disease. You don't have to die from heart disease. You don't have to die from diabetes. You don't have to die from strokes. You can do something about these things, not just preventing, but also reversing these diseases. This is a seismic revolution. And it's very exciting. I mean, our forks and knives can be weapons of mass destruction, or as we talked about today, they can be instruments of hope, health, and healing. You are very, very fortunate as a group listening in today that you have two wonderful ladies that are voluntarily give of their time and energy and money to promote these kind of concepts, make it available to people around the world. I mean, I was amazed. You mentioned that you had people from Minneapolis, you had people from Mexico. I mean, <laughs> your, your, your parish, your field of activity is enlarging by leaps and bounds and you deserve it because you're doing such a wonderful job. And thank you for the privilege of being on your program. Thank you so much. Your support is what is helping us to get the message out here in the UK. And we are seeing now the incredible uh, global um, reach that uh, with your blessings we have been able to reach now. So we are really very grateful and for bringing this uh, succinctly uh, presented information that we are trying to get out there. Um, it is definitely um, the video that our patients have to see to change their lives for good. Um, and uh, before we move on um, to our informal group consultation, our favorite part of the show where we are not recording at the event, where all of you can join and speak to Dr. Um, uh, uh, Hans Steele in person. Before that, whilst we have heard so many uh, incredible lifestyle change, changes that we can already implement right away, um, could we ask you what would be the three actionable practical takeaways that um, our listeners can implement right away from your own personal experience to take control of their overall health? Well, I think the first step is to recognize that medicine is very limited on what it can offer when it comes to dealing with chronic diseases. That's the first takeaway. We have to first abandon the idea that there's a magic drug that you can just swallow and everything is going to be taken care of. No, what you have done for the last 10, 20, 30 years is going to be following you in terms of what happens inside your arteries and inside of your body. So that's the first takeaway. Number two, move towards a diet where you eat more foods as grown. The foods that are designated as being only uh, taking up 14% of the Western calories, right? And we said, begin to eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lots of beans. Here in, in California, we have 50 kinds of different beans. They're very nutritious. They're high in fiber. And you say, well, no, doctor, you don't understand. Uh, they're antisocial, really. Really? What do you mean antisocial? Oh, Oh, I see you mean, I see what you mean. You feel that you cannot be in society anymore because you don't know how to control uh, some um, outlets. Folks, you don't have to worry about this. Yeah, you have some gas problems. You do, you do. Because when you introduce the beans that are high in fiber and you're not used to that, the body begins to grumble and uh, there are some, uh, yeah, there's, there's no gas shortage when it comes to uh, following this kind of a program during the first two, three weeks. But after two, three weeks, everything calms down. You're just fine. You don't have to worry about anymore that something escapes into the ether <laughs> and people begin to, no, it's all taken care of. So the second thing to take uh, away from here is move more towards foods as grown, simply prepared. And number three, don't forget to get your 10,000 steps in, walk every day, okay? What incredible three actionable points that all of us can take on immediately. And remember, don't be scared of gas. <laughs> <laughs> 
We are exchanging a little bit of uh, a lot of disease for a little bit of gas. So <laughs> it's all right. And it does settle. We have gone through uh, our transition with Erica as well. And we can attest that it does calm down after the first month or two. <laughs> Oh, two even. Oh, my goodness. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it does. You know, yeah, it's, it's okay. Two or three weeks, things it's are settling down. Now, if you happen to go back and to some dietary indiscretions, the whole world will know because the gas comes back. So there is a giveaway. Um, Certainly also it depends on where patients have started and what was their baseline diet and um, how is their microbiota at that point, right? Yes. Certainly. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hans Thiel. Um, we have a website for you where they can uh, connect with you, uh, which we are just adding here into the chat and also we'll add it up on youtube which you can watch back right away because this was a live event so you have the um link available right now if you want to share it with your loved ones to save a life and to help them live a long and fulfilling one uh, we have heard in may and june about um heart disease and diabetes. And next week we have the inspiring Jimmy Quinn join us to share his own journey of how he has been managing his heart disease after having a bypass surgery at only 41 years old. Many of you have asked for more resources on lifestyle medicine, and we are working with Dr. Deal uh, to create a powerful resource on lifestyle medicine. Uh, more on this to come. Do stay connected with us on social media and say hello on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, links are here on the chat. And if you can just search for Afternoon Tea with Docs on Instagram, uh, YouTube and Facebook, you can find us there. And you can by become... Way, oh, yes. By the way, do we have the U-turn booklet available to people that turn in today? tuned in turned so in the uh patient resource booklet that we were discussing is going to be available for everyone we'll send it out um to to all the email addresses uh when technically we were a little bit challenged to upload it but as soon as this is available we'll send it out to them okay so this is a free book a booklet that talks about curing incurable chronic diseases, right? I'm so happy to partner with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It certainly is a small little, uh, it's, it's, it's a booklet that you can implement in your life right away. Um, all the research is available in it um, that you need to have a look at the, uh, what you have just seen from the presentation today. Um, and you can download it from the website soon. Um, and um, you can also become a free Afternoon Tea with Docs member to continue this conversation and join the supportive community helping you to implement the healthful lifestyle changes you want that will help you live a long and fulfilling life. Um, and this is a place where you can, you know, share your challenges and share tips with each other um, and uh, keep each other accountable. Um, please do comment in the chat below. Um, your thoughts and feedback from today and for those of you watching from youtube please do comment below and let us know how we're doing um, and um, thank you for listening and have a lovely evening and we'll stop recording thank you fantastic well